Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I am pleased to rise to today's motion because I think it provides an opportunity to understand a little better um, some of the thinking of our Conservative colleagues in the House and I think actually lays out quite nicely some of, some of the deficiencies in their thinking about the current uh, economic problems that we're facing in Canada. And it's also an opportunity to highlight some of the ways in which New Democrats think differently about these things and the different kinds of solutions that we would propose to the problems of our day. So I thought I might proceed just by kind of walking through the motion, as it were, Mr. Speaker, beginning with the first premise of the motion, subsection 1, which says excessive government spending has increased the deficit, the national debt, and fueled inflation to its highest level in 31 years. Now, I think there is clearly a sense in which it's trivially true that uh, government spending increases the deficit. It's hard to have a public deficit if a government isn't spending money. So, I mean, that's true. I think it's always important to ask what government is getting for that expenditure, or perhaps more specifically and importantly, Mr. Speaker, what the public and what Canadians are getting for that expenditure. Because there are different kinds of expenditure. There are expenditures that are simply expenditures that are, that are, that are passing. Uh, and then there's expenditure that represents investment. And of course, one of, the, one of the important aspects of investment is return. And when we talk about public spending, there are different ways that you can get return on investment. You can get return on investment on the public books themselves. And sometimes we see that when government invests in things that increase government revenue so that government itself actually ends up getting more money coming back and that's reflected on its books. But when we talk about public investment, and I think this is an important difference from investment in the private sector, where you see this far less because it's a different mandate. Having a mandate to increase private profit is very different than having a public interest mandate. So sometimes when we invest from the public purse, the return on investment is experienced not on the government books, but is experienced by the public, sometime in their household books, um, and sometimes in the benefit of, of employment and other things. And of course, these are obviously things that affect household budgets. So for instance, when New Democrats talk about public expenditure on something like pharmacare, that's not because we love larger government programs for their own sake, or because we think that this spending won't benefit Canadians or that there won't be a return on investment, quite the contrary. Mr. Speaker, we support and have fought for a long time and are looking forward to making further progress on a national pharmacare plan because we understand that that is going to have a direct impact on the household budgets of Canadians. So many Canadians that we've heard from, and in fact, I've heard Conservatives raise the issue of Canadians who are struggling to afford their medications, having to cut pills, having to raid other budgets like their food budget and their budget for rent in order to get the life-saving medication that we need. That's why New Democrats support public investment in something that will lower the cost of prescription drugs. That makes sense to us. And that is a philosophical difference because it says that we should be sharing the costs of trying to provide the things that our families and our communities all need. And that it's wrong for a small cross-section, the top 1% or 10%, depending on how you measure it or how you look at it, should get to walk away with a larger piece of the pie and a growingly larger or increasingly larger piece of the pie while so many in Canada continue to struggle. So when we say, let's get it off the government books, it doesn't go away. And the federal government could give itself a pat on the back, as Conservatives did in the Harper years for having smaller deficits. But those deficits don't go away. They get transferred to the household budgets of Canadians who continue to struggle with the cost of prescription drugs, who continue to struggle in the context of a housing market that has gotten out of control, who continue to struggle with the cost of dental care, for which very few Canadians have ever had any meaningful help. And we're optimistic about children now being able, from low-income families, now being able to afford 
and their parents to be able to afford to get help with those real problems that can have a lasting impact on their lives and the, and the real financial cost of, of them being able to get access to that service. So is it true that government spending contributes to deficits? Well, of course. In fact, you don't have deficits without government spending. But the question is, is that spending addressing other real deficits in the household income of Canadians? And depending on the expenditure, and I've just argued that in the case of pharmacare and dental care, and I, I could go on, but I won't because I want to get to the other parts of the motion, that that has an impact by reducing the household deficits of many, many Canadians while increasing their access to services. That's a deficit that exists. It's just that low-income Canadians are facing that deficit on their own. It's not measured and publicly reported somewhere. By having a public program, we can increase access to those services that are so important for Canadians' lives. And yes, that means we're actually going to be measuring and recording that deficit somewhere gladly for me and for New Democrats somewhere where it means we're sharing that cost collectively, including with the people who have the most ability to pay for those things. And unfortunately, many Canadians just aren't in a position to pay for those things, less and less Canadians as inflation increases. The other issue with this first clause is that it pretends wrongly that government spending is the only driver of inflation. And I think it's pretty obvious to anyone with ears to hear and eyes to see that, that, is not, that that's not the case. Certainly, we've heard at the Finance Committee summer of the opinion that quantitative easing in the, in the context of the pandemic has increased the access to capital and that has allowed particularly investors to drive up the cost of housing. There are actually ways to address that that don't involve any more public expenditure. For instance, having a higher down payment requirement for investors, as opposed to people who are trying to buy their own family home, is a way that the government could cool the investment climate in the Canadian housing market without spending a dime. Having a differential rate on CMHC mortgage insurance for people who are buying investment properties as opposed to principal residences is another way that without spending a dime, in fact, it would cause more revenue to come in to the extent that the investment culture continued and to the extent that it didn't, it would relieve demand in the housing market, which presumably should have a cooling effect on prices. But to pretend that quantitative easing was the only reason why there has been incredible inflation in the housing market, which incidentally isn't even really represented in the CPI figures. And that's been the subject of some debate at the Finance Committee. In fact, as housing prices cool in response to higher interest rates, it's likely that we'll see inflation go up in the short term because that's actually recorded. But these are, these are questions about how accountants and economists record inflation and I think are less directly connected to what Canadians are actually experiencing. Um, and so even if the nominal inflation rate goes up, if housing prices are coming down, Canadians are going to benefit even in the context where apparently inflation is going up. I think it's, it's, it makes no sense to talk about inflation in the current context without recognizing the production stoppages that have occurred as a result of the pandemic. And there's still a lot of recovery happening because we have a just-in-time economy. And so there, it's not like there were massive piles of inventory. And, and production capacity is pretty well attuned in many industries to demand. And so trying to make up for lost time is a difficult thing. That's going to take time. And in the meantime, we've seen climate-induced natural disasters wreak havoc on the infrastructure required to deliver goods in a timely way in that just-in-time economy I was just talking about, Mr. Speaker, and that drives up costs as well. There are a number of other causes of inflation that are well outside the control of government, and that's why we think it's so important that the government act on the things it can act on and make a difference where it can. The second bullet recognizes that there is a carbon tax increase coming. There's no question. It talks about escalator taxes, I think specifically referring to the escalator on the excise tax. And it talks about Canada pension plan premiums as a, as a tax. Now, 
Again, there's a kind of trivial sense in which that's true. As it happens, accountants for convenience have chosen to record Canada Pension Plan uh, costs in their payroll tax ledger. Well, fair enough. I'm glad that that's convenient for accountants, but we shouldn't allow ourselves to be duped by a reasonable professional standard that allows them to talk about the cost per person on their payroll into thinking that the Canada Pension Plan is really a tax. Because it's not. It's part of the wage package that Canadians expect when they go into work. They don't just look at their hourly wage. They look at their benefit package, if they're fortunate enough to be employed in a workplace that has one. And that's certainly something that we want for more Canadians. We also recognize that when you have universal programs, whether it's pharmacare or dental care, that that helps provide a competitive advantage to Canadian companies over their international competitors. Because it's something that helps them to attract workers in the context of a labor shortage without having to pay the cost of those plans. They may pay them through their taxes. If we have a fair tax system, they will pay for it. They'll pay for it through their taxes. But the simplicity of being able to offer your employees good benefits makes locating in Canada uh, a more competitive and a more attractive option for international firms. We know this to be true because that has been true of Medicare over the years. And that's something that many companies look favor favorably upon when they're considering where to locate their company. But Canada, the Canada Pension Plan isn't a tax. It's part of the wage package for which employees show up to work every day. And I've heard Conservatives get up in the House and talk about how difficult inflation is on seniors because their pension isn't keeping up with expenses. Well, one of the ways that you do that is build in a better pension for Canadian workers. And the only universal, fully portable plan we have is the Canada Pension Plan. In fact, over 70% of Canadian workers right now don't have a workplace pension, which means the CPP is the only pension that they have, apart from their own individual investments. And you can be sure, Mr. Speaker, that when we talk about Canadians who are only $200 a month away from bankruptcy every month, that they're not able to put a lot into any kind of personal savings vehicle to have their personal plan for retirement, which means CPP is what they'll be left with. And that's why it is important to have higher CPP premiums in order to build a public pension plan that can actually allow people to retire with dignity and to bear some of the additional costs that do happen over time as we see prices increase. It has been a problem that pensions have not kept pace with the cost of inflation and the way to do that is to build a stronger public pension plan. If we mislead Canadians by calling that a simple tax increase, then I think we're leading them down the garden path and we're perpetuating a problem of pension income that has already been the case for far too long. So yes, there are some tax increases. I would say there are some things being called tax increases in this motion that are not in fact tax increases and it does a disservice to Canadians to pretend that these things are tax increases when they're clearly not. They say that the government refuses to provide relief to Canadians by temporarily re uh, reducing the goods and services tax on gasoline and diesel. That's true. It's not happening. I would say for our part, I would remind the House that last week New Democrats proposed an amendment to the Conservative motion. What we said was that we're, we are willing to consider broad-based temporary tax relief as, as one way to try and help Canadians through a, different, uh, a, 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 a difficult time. But we propose that that tax relief come on home heating instead of gas at the pump. And there were a number of reasons for that. There are more people that heat their home than drive. There are people who heat their home with things other than gasoline. And so providing tax relief in that way would be a way of providing tax relief that, that, that isn't kind of prejudiced in favor of, of the oil and gas sector, but would, but would recognize a more diverse suite of energy proposals and we also argued that in many cases when it comes to utilities for home heating there's there's regulation on price increases which means it's harder for companies to simply char make up the difference that's caused by the lower tax by raising prices to capture those though that kind of fiscal room for themselves to increase their profits instead of passing it on to consumers we thought those were at least three very good reasons to provide that broad-based temporary tax relief on home heating instead of gas at the pump. 
And all we've gotten from the Conservatives so far on that was a simple no. Canadians may not know that on Opposition Day motions, the, the person who presents the motion has to agree in order for an amendment to be debated and, and uh, voted on. I asked earlier today um, the member who's, who brought this, uh, this motion forward, the MP for Abbotsford, if he could explain to the House why Conservatives were not prepared to entertain temporary tax relief on home heating instead of gas at the pump. And while he did say a lot of things in response, he didn't mention home heating at all. And so we continue to wait on that answer. So I would say, Mr. Speaker, that I think the motion misrepresents the will of the House, that there is an opportunity to talk and to compromise on the question of temporary broad-based tax relief. But when we proposed a solution to that and a way forward and an attempt to try and cooperate and find consensus, Conservatives declined that opportunity and uh, shouldn't have been surprised that their motion, therefore, didn't pass. And so what is the final call to action of this motion, Mr. Speaker? It's that the House call on the government to present a federal budget rooted in fiscal responsibility with no new taxes, a path to balance, and a meaningful fiscal anchor. And here, I think, is the incoherence in the motion because it talks about a path to balance. It talks about fiscal responsibility. And it explicitly excludes the entire revenue side of balancing the books. I think rare is the conversation around corporate boardroom tables where they come in and say, all right, guys, our books are in bad shape. We need to figure this one out for the sake of our investors. We want, we want to be able to pay out higher dividends and better return on shares. But we're not raising any new revenue. We're not going to talk about how our company can raise new revenue or increase its revenue. We just want to get back to balance without any question of revenue. And that makes no sense. In the public context, it makes no sense because as the Parliamentary Budget Officer reported just in December, 1% of Canadians now own and control 25% of the wealth that's generated in Canada. And they're walking away with it without paying any taxes on it through tax haven agreements. Previously, the PBO has estimated that's costing Canadian taxpayers $25 billion a year. And the fact that the Conservatives would talk about balancing the budget and deliberately exclude looking at that as a way to try and bring things back to balance, instead of simply cutting things that Canadians are depending upon, mystifies me. Mr. Speaker, and it's one of the important differences between Conservatives and New Democrats, because I think tax havens should absolutely be part of the conversation. New Democrats have also ran on having a wealth tax for fortunes over $10 million. There's not a lot of people with fortunes of $10 million or more dollars in Canada asking them to pay a little bit more, particularly in light of having seen Canada's billionaires expand their wealth exponentially during the pandemic, it is ridiculous to me that that idea would be ruled out of order and not a possibility without further debate or discussion. We've seen a number of large companies in certain industries make a lot more profit. They were profitable before the pandemic, but they became even more profitable during the pandemic. And it's why New Democrats continue to insist on the idea of having an excess profit tax, where we look at their average profits over the years in advance of the pandemic, and we look at their average profits post-pandemic, and on the amount that their pandemic profits exceed their pre-pandemic average, that we have a higher incremental rate of tax to make sure that they're paying their fair share and that they're not profiteering on the pandemic. That is a reasonable way to be able to fund the services that Canadians need, to be able to fund some of the things that Conservatives themselves, depending on the day, will call for to provide relief to Canadian households that are in economic distress. But this motion says, no, none of that. We're not interested in hearing those ideas. We're not interested in talking about the revenue side of balancing the budget. And we in the NEP think that's uh, preposterous, and it's why we won't be supporting the motion today. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Returning to debate, uh, questions and comments uh, to the, uh, the intervention from the Honourable Member from Elmwood Transcona, uh, the Honourable Member for, uh, uh, I'll say, Edmonton Manning. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, for the opportunity. The NDP uh, backed the government um, that is presenting uh, a, a budget with no plan to balance whatsoever. Uh, the NDP is giving this government to 2025 a full backup to run a deficit, uh, the, doubling the debt, the national debt by within six and a half years um, uh, to the highest level. Inflation is at the highest in decades. Um, uh, Canadians cannot make ends meet as far as bringing food or going to schools or, or, or buying a car or going on transportation or doing anything in their life. So their life is getting more expensive by the day and still the NDP are backing the government. So I'm not sure how the honorable member can defend the, his position and the government position as well as far as where the money is going to come from. That is the question that they're not asking. They, they want all these fantasies of spending at all levels. They want to please everybody. But the question that they're not asking themselves is, where is the money is coming from? And as far as now, the money only coming from the Canadians that need the money the most, Canadians that cannot make ends meet, and Canadians that they want to see a better future. So can the, 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 the Honourable Member tell us, where is the money going to come from? L'Honourable Député d'Elmwood Trans... The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Mr. Speaker, in response to that question, I'd start by noting that Canada's not alone in having made massive expenditures during the pandemic period. We're uh, alongside our G20 uh, colleagues uh, in having made incredible expenditure. Um, so that's not something that's out of the ordinary in terms of responding to the pandemic. A lot of that spending went into direct transfers to individual households to help weather the economic consequences of the pandemic. And finally, I would just reiterate a few of the points from the end of my speech, which are very much about revenue. The point about having a wealth tax on fortunes of $10 million and over as a way to generate revenue. The point about closing tax havens that are allowing $25 billion in tax revenue from the most wealthy, not the people who are struggling with the cost of inflation, but the people that are best able to, uh, to uh, cope with that inflation are getting away with a further 12, 25 billion dollars in wealth every year because of our tax haven arrangements. So these are things that we can do to address the revenue side. It's simply not true that New Democrats aren't interested in the question of where the money comes from. We simply don't agree with Conservatives that the wealthiest among us should continue to get a free ride while everyone else struggles. Question and commentaire, l'honorable secrétaire parlementaire du leader du gouvernement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, one of the things that I think gets missed out in a lot of the uh, conservative rhetoric that we hear is when, when they say stop spending government dollars on programs, to use the example of child care. Um, in Canada, for the first time, we now have a national child care plan. And if you take a look in terms of the impact, Mr. Speaker, it had in your home province of Quebec, uh, the $10 uh, uh, child care plan increased the workforce significantly in the province of Quebec. The same is believed to happen at the national level, where we will have more people engaged in the workforce. So yes, there is a cost to providing that plan, but there's many social and economic benefits because there's going to be more people in the workforce and those people in the workforce will be paying taxes. And I'm wondering if my, my friend could provide his thoughts in regards to all spending. Just because you spend money doesn't necessarily mean that there is an absolute cost. Often there is revenue that's also generated. Well, thank the honourable member for, for returning to one of the points that I was making in my speech, which is the idea of public investment and the ways in which the public can get return on investment from public spending. Childcare is a very good example. It's well documented that investment in childcare can help grow the economy. And one of the byproducts of growing the economy is an increase in government revenue. This was an argument that we made uh, vociferously here in this place from 2015 onward. Uh, at the time, Liberals were ridiculing us, saying that um, this was not something that they could do, that it didn't make sense from, because it was a provincial jurisdiction, provinces would never agree to it, they wouldn't be interested in the money. We of course knew that leadership and money coming from the federal government would allow for provinces to get more ambitious in the childcare services that they, that they provide. 
and that that would have a beneficial effect on the economy. We're glad that the Liberals finally came around on childcare. It's why we continue to push on a number of measures. We've brought them around on dental care after they voted against it only nine months ago. And we're looking forward to similar returns on investment for the Canadian public by putting this program in place as well. Question and commentary, the Honorable Deputy of St. Hyacinthe Bagot. The Honorable Member for St. Hyacinthe Bagot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When you're talking about balancing the books, it seems to me that the concept of tax fairness is fundamental to talk about reducing the deficit without talking about the problem of tax havens, without talking about the possibility of a wealth tax, the idea of taxing those who benefited most from the pandemic. A lot of small business was really at the end of their tether during the pandemic, but others and, and some were having to close up shop. But I think we can't talk about reducing the deficit without talking about who is paying the biggest price for that. Uh, and we can't look what happened with uh, Paul Martin and Chrétien. Uh, what, what are we really talking about here? The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. The question, and indeed, I mean, you know, not just provinces, but the people that they served suffered immensely when the Chrétien Martin government of the 90s made the deepest cuts to the health and social transfer that, that, that we've seen. And, you know, New Democrats are concerned to restore a meaningful role for the federal government in, in funding health services. In some cases, that means doing it ambitiously with uh, programs in collaboration with the uh, provinces that will bring new services to uh, Canadians through uh, public funding, but also in making up for the simple absence of federal funding with some unconditional funding for the provinces as well. And we think that there's an appropriate mix of those things that can contribute to uh, improving health and other services in uh, Canada. And that the way to do that is to make sure that the wealthiest are paying their fair share. And there's a trajectory over the last 30 or more years in Canada of the people at the top paying less and less in tax. In fact, a Liberal platform commitment was to have a minimum tax be, uh, imposed on the wealthiest because we find that actually their rate of tax, their effective rate of taxation often is less than the poorest Canadians who are paying tax in Canada. There's something incredibly perverse about that and that's something government action can fix and it'll have a salutary effect on the books here in Ottawa if we do it. On a le temps pour une question de... We have time for a short question virtually. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my honourable friend from Elmwood Transcona. I want to get back to the idea that we should be uh, cancelling the increase in the carbon tax because of its impact for Canadians. Just to review some reality that we haven't had injected yet. It, and, uh, as of tomorrow, the carbon tax impact per litre of gas will be 2.2 cents a litre. But the global instability on the price of gas, obviously because of what we're seeing happening in Ukraine and the lockdowns in China, have had volatility of up to 32 cents in the last month in the GTA. And yes, we have gas experts predicting it'll drop by 15 cents because of increased supplies opening up reserves. Can the honor member comment on what I see as the increase uh, in the gas tax for purposes of the carbon price as being so small as to be a blip in a sea of volatility? One minute, the Honourable Deputy Delmour. One minute, the Honourable Member. Very much. And I think uh, the uh, member from Sanish Gulf Islands makes an excellent point. In fact, I think in my lifetime alone, I've seen long weekends have a bigger impact on the price of gasoline uh, than, uh, than, than the carbon tax at times. I mean, we know that oil and gas companies are prepared to raise the price at the pump for just about any reason, sometimes no reason at all. So I think it's the wrong focus if we're going to talk about meaningful tax relief for Canadians in this difficult time. It's why we propose uh, providing some relief on home heating costs instead, because often those prices are regulated uh, and companies actually have to provide a justification for why they want to see a rate increase and can be denied those rate increases if there isn't an adequate reason. 
Uh, so uh, it was very much along those lines that we proposed that amendment that the Conservatives refused last week. Merci, Monsieur.